You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Alan. And I'm Sarah. And welcome to this week's show. So we're at the end of March and it is not quite garden season yet outdoors, but we're getting there. We're very, 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 very excited. We're deeply into fool's spring. Fool's spring? What do you mean? Fool's spring. It's that time of year where you think it's spring because it's not January anymore, but really spring doesn't start like, well, for... I don't even want to say how long it's going to take before it's actually spring. I know. This time of year, I definitely, at least once every 10 days or every week, start going through all the photos on my phone and looking at, okay, when when do the crocuses actually come out? Okay, when do the leaves come out? Okay, when do things happen? Because it feels like it's going to happen any moment. But yeah, you're right. It takes a long time. Nothing really exciting happens until May 15th. No, that's not true. That's when the tulips are out. That's when there's leaves and buds on the trees or flowers, blooms. That's when things are green and it starts to feel like the beginning of summer. But until May 15th, around here anyways... It's kind of a little bit brownish gray. Yeah, I feel like May 15th, when I look at those photos, it's just like every color in our garden all at once. Like there's, you know, the tulips and the primroses and like everything just going crazy. But earlier than that, it's sort of like one at a time, right? Like, And I think that we're really, we live in a time where we don't understand how integrated we are with our neighbors to the south when it comes to food. I just can't even really wrap my head around what it would have been like to live here in the Maritimes 100, 200 years ago. Even when my mother was growing up in rural Nova Scotia in the 1950s, it was such a different world. There was no food. Yeah, I mean, at this time of year, there is no food. Like, it's too cold to plant outside. And people didn't have greenhouses. No, so they wouldn't have like had overwintered food at all. And definitely not heated greenhouses, which is where a lot of local food comes from right now. So you would be totally dependent on what you had in your cold cellar. Um, 200 years ago, or further back than that, you would have been depending on maybe the potatoes you would have around, parsnips, carrots, turnips that you might have in your root cellar. Um, And those, nowadays we have potatoes all year round. They're harvested in September and then they're put into cold storage in an environment that is like low oxygen so that they don't go bad and we can have French fries all year round. But potato crops in the past in the root cellar, like at this time of year, they start to lose a lot of their moisture and they don't have as much nutrition. They're harder to like, they don't cook up as nice as they do. And so all of your vegetables that you had in your root cellar would be hitting that point. And not only are your vegetables emaciated, but all of the animals who have just survived through the winter are all skinny and their fat reserves are all gone. So going out and hunting a squirrel or a rabbit is not like, there's not a huge amount of nutritional value Mm -hmm. in that. And chickens also, we were talking about this with uh, folks who own chickens the other day, like they don't lay very well this time of year. They're waiting for the days to get longer. They've maybe started, but they really often take a break over the winter. But the chickens need to eat stuff too. Exactly, yeah. No, they lay way better when there's lots of insects and lots of greens around for them to eat. And then you have cows and dairy. Like uh, a long time ago, dairy cows would have to give birth before they start to milk. Right, that wouldn't happen until the spring. And they need food, they need fodder, and like the best milk comes from fresh grass. So yeah, we're just so lucky that we have lettuce and baby spinach and those like weird yeah, totally. little carroty things all year round. So full spring would have been a hungry time of year, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, we just... And these days, like we have a lot of strategies to to remedy that situation. So we have uh, cold frames and greenhouses. Uh, We have plastic and like all the negative things about plastic. Boy, you can really grow well under plastic. Yeah, definitely. So in the past, if you like, there were definitely greenhouses hundreds of years ago in like, you know, Royal 
you know, horticultural society gardens that are very old, but that was like elitist stuff. Like you might, if you were like a landed gentry, you might have an orangerium, but uh, plastic makes it so much easier for just the average common person to be able to do a cold frame or a tunnel or a hoop or a unheated greenhouse. Um, and that really makes it so that it's not actually fool spring underneath that plastic. So in our larder, we also have different ways to preserve food so we can eat at this time of year. Like we're going through the freezers and figuring out what we have left over from last year's garden. Because there still are a few things and we want to get them, get them used up before we start with new food. So from a chef's perspective, trying to do traditional foods that would have been served in this area a long time ago is really, really hard. Like there's a few things that you could eat now, which would be things like salt cod, uh, which people would probably have, as well as preserved meats, mostly salted, like a lot of salted stuff, things that were canned, uh, you might have around, um, some old potatoes, butter, I think, often people had for quite a while, and cheese, uh, ferments, cabbage, uh, like sauerkraut and other things like that. So often, like at this point in time, we are tricked into thinking that we should be having like strawberries and rhubarb, but like that doesn't actually come until like four months from now, like actual spring vegetable or fruits and vegetables don't really come in Canada where we are until the end of June. Before then, we'll get greens and we can make nice salads and, and do things like that. And then there's also foods from the ocean. As soon as the ice would go out of small harbors, if you live near the ocean, you can collect seaweeds. Uh, you could get at some mollusks, but mollusks also hibernate over the winter. So they're often like, they're not as fat and juicy and sweet this time of year, but they are edible and you can use them in a stew or like a chowder, uh, which would be one way to serve them. But so I often at this time of year, I get very frustrated that a lot of restaurants and grocery stores are really advertising spring foods, but those don't really exist except for if you're really willing to eat food that's coming from the southern United States, Mexico, or further afield. What we really need for plants to grow is we need the soil to be warm enough for seeds to germinate and for uh, plants to sprout. And that's sort of like what we're waiting for outside at this point of the year. And they're waiting for that soil to get warm enough that things can actually, water mo can move, basically. It's all about water movement. And if it freezes for half the day, it's below zero, then water can't move and plants can't grow. But we're a technologically advanced society and we can make it so that water moves. We can have cold frames, we can have unheated greenhouses, we can use heat pads, and we can also do things inside. Yeah, the water is so essential to the seed germinating. I mean, right now I've got all my seed packages and I've got all the seeds ready to go, but then just figuring out what it, what it takes to actually germinate that seed and then to support the plant to grow. Like it's a long, long journey between buying that seed package and having it in your hand and then having something that is a viable plant that then produces the food. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. One thing I came across the other day was just the idea that any seed that you have is actually alive, which kind of blew my mind. Yeah, you really think of seeds as being like unalive. Yeah, like but kind of inert or like just sort of, you know, they are inactive, but... They're dormant life. Exactly. So they're just dehydrated and they're waiting for... The right conditions, but there's still a little bit of like respiration going on there. So by that I mean like oxygen exchange in and out of the seed. They they need they that. Breathe. They breathe for real, really slowly and like mm. not very much, but it still happens. So all of those seeds have like such a huge amount of potential for life, and water is the most important thing that they need there. They also presumably need some sort of heat. Yeah. They need the right so temperature. So after like, because water is available after like at plus one degrees Celsius. Totally. But you're saying that different plants need different temperatures to 
germinate. Yeah. So seeds, they need water that's going to move into the cells and it's going to make the, all the biological processes start to happen, but they are also going to need the right temperature. So the temperature is crucial in actually like helping those uh, chemical reactions happen that turn the the stored food in the seeds into actual food that they can use to grow. So I planted radish seeds in the greenhouse like two weeks ago, and they just germinated yesterday. So radishes can germinate when the soil is around like five or six degrees Celsius, which uh, the greenhouse, you know, is reaching that temperature easily. Whereas outside the greenhouse, it's not there yet. It's still frozen in a couple of areas. Okay, top five cold plant seeds. Oh, yeah, good good one. Uh, radishes, mustard. Uh, but mustard, like, people think of mustard as the yellow stuff that's oh, okay, in a squeezy yeah. bottle. Mustard greens. Right. So, like, all of those, like, beautiful, like, frilly, purple, veined mustard. Um, some of it's, like, big flat leaves. Some of it's, like, really finely, like, serrated leaves. There's all different kinds. Okay, so it's a green, but it's often purple. Yeah, it's often purple. It can be purple or green. Okay. okay, okay, so that's, I can't, I lost count. Okay, so that was two. Radishes, mustard greens, uh, cilantro, that's another one that germinates, like under 10 degree soil. So cilantro, also known as coriander, uh, is often associated with foods from the global south. Like, it goes on, like, noodle bowls from Vietnam and Thailand, like pho and... It also is something yeah, that used you, in Mexican cooking, Mexican all the food, time. but it actually is a cold loving crop. Yeah, I know. It's it actually amazing. doesn't even grow very well in warm weather. So I don't really get that. But anyway, so number three is cilantro. Number three, cilantro. That was an easy one to plant early. And uh, number four would be kale. But I was thinking about the top five edible plants. <laughs> And nobody actually wants to eat kale. Oh, come on. You're a chef. You, you must know nice ways to serve kale. My entire, like, early career working, like, in the 80s and 90s in restaurants, kale was used as a garnish underneath things, and nobody ate it. Mm, and it was usually point. that, like, kale, you know, the purple, like, round-headed kale. What's that called? I remember we used to use it in the restaurant, but it also grew in the Halifax Commons. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like an ornamental kale, yeah. like a cabbage head kale, sometimes they're called. Yeah, but no one ate it. But now, you know, hippies. Yeah, yeah I mean, kale and is vegan. especially delicious when it's small. So that's like a good way to eat it. Just plant it now, and it grows pretty slowly, and then it's, it's super delicious. We grow like, uh, well, we grew it one year. It was like walking stick kale, which is like kind of popular... <laughs> in the uk but it like grows it's biannual so it grows for two years and it's a great big stick and it can grow like six ten feet tall and just like you peel one or two leaves off but it's not like micro kale it's like cook cook it to death kale so it's one thing to grow it it's another thing to eat it so That's... that's i think number four and then number five i would say would be like green onions and chives so they, uh, they germinate at cold temperatures, but also if you can get them going, like we've been poking around in the garden and there's green onions that were from last year that didn't get harvested that are growing now. And there's chives in the greenhouse that are up about six inches. So they maybe, uh, they're growing from last year and they'll grow really, really, really early. So I think it's a pretty good list. I would say that, uh, I would have added spinach to that list, right? Totally. um, instead of kale, probably. Well, there's Miner's lettuce, which is like super cold. Yeah, there's another like famous cold crop. Uh, I'll say famous in like the, the organic gardening world. That's called mashe, mm. or mash, or corn salad. But I've never really loved the flavor of it, and it's it grows like tiny little leaves and. Uh, it's a little bit finicky to harvest. Like the leaves don't get very big, so you have to be kind of cutting the tiny little leaves out. And I find it tastes a little bit like floral and soapy, but maybe that's just me. A lot of people think cilantro is soapy too. Yeah, it's true. Uh, the other one I was uh, thinking of was parsley. I really like parsley. Oh yeah, that's a good point. And we've got a bunch of parsley in the greenhouse, again, that's from last year that we moved in. So it's a biennial, so it'll start to bolt when it, the weather gets warmer, but it's it's growing now pretty actively. So parsley and uh, cilantro are both carrots. 
Uh, can I grow carrots? Yeah, some people will seed carrots right now. One of our local organic farms, Wismical Farm, they have a greenhouse that's heated just a little bit. A lot of farmers, what they do is they'll heat a greenhouse just to like around seven, eight, nine degrees Celsius. So that's where the sort of sweet spot is. People have done a lot of research and trials and figured out that if you can heat it just that much, you're not wasting a lot of energy uh, and the plants will grow. So they have seeded carrots, actually. I was talking to Graham mm -hmm. uh, from Murray Corner. He'd sold us some, some uh, garlic and he gave us a big bag of spinach but he said he overwintered broccoli. Really? Uh, yeah. Cool. Which I kind of heard about, but thought was maybe a bit of a myth because I couldn't really understand why you would do that. But he gave it a shot. Um, and it didn't exactly work out. They're mostly getting like broccoli raw, like the little I was going to say, probably like the sort of sprouting broccoli or broccoli raw would work really well. So it didn't really grow over the winter. And then like in the hot, like in the unheated greenhouses, it's just like bolting really fast. Right. So it didn't really work, but it's an interesting idea. But something I was going to talk about is based on like the ideas of cold storage is garlic. So he was by the other day and just mentioned that he had a bunch of garlic uh, around and I was like, awesome. We're kind of out of garlic, local garlic that is. You can always get commodity garlic that comes from different places uh, a lot of people don't like the stuff that comes from China for some reason. I'm not sure why it's any worse if it comes from there than anywhere else. Because people say they irradiate it. Oh, yeah. And they also say that they grow it on human feces. But, like, yeah. we grow a lot of things on human feces in a lot of different parts of the world. So, you know, but we've got it before that comes from, like, uh, South America at this time of year. But anyway, we got some garlic, and it was mostly good, but some of it's starting to turn a bit punky. And it's hard to store it to find the right conditions of humidity and light uh, to keep it, like, from sprouting or turning or various years. It's susceptible to various molds um, and different fungi. So there's a couple of strategies. So luckily... Uh, my mom was visiting and she just loves to do something like peel garlic for four hours. It's yeah, just Ka like... Kathy grew up on a farm. <laughs> so like any little task like that is just like super satisfying work, which I get as well. And I, yeah, I didn't so grow up on a farm. But... Anytime we have a big harvest of like gooseberries or strawberries or anything that needs a little bit of work done to it, like coring or picking or whatever, mom's really into it. Um, anyway, so she went through and peeled all the garlic and then... One thing you can do with it uh, to keep it if you have a bunch of garlic around or a strategy if you have a bunch of garlic and you want to have it in the spring. Because, like, we're not going to get anything close to local garlic until, like, mid-June when we have scapes. Yeah. And then the garlic harvest is, like, end of July and then it has to dry out. So it's going to be a while. And if you want local garlic, it may not last that long in your pantry. So you can... Peel it and freeze it. Okay. You're not going to have the same texture because the formation of ice crystals is going to break down the cells and it's going to get kind of soft and squishy. But if you're just using it in a stir fry or a stew, yeah. it'll be fine. Because garlic's not something that most people eat fresh for its crunch anyway, right? No. And various varieties and at certain times you would do that, but mm -hmm. not necessarily with older garlic. Yeah. And then the other thing that I like to do, which I did with most of it, is garlic confit. And what you do in that situation is you take the peeled garlic, you put it in a pot, you cover it with olive oil or canola oil would work as well, and you cook it at a really low temperature until it softens up and changes color. You don't want to cook it at a really high heat. You don't want to get it crispy or deep fry it, which is what would happen if you cooked in oil at high temperature. You want to just like simmer it and bring it up until it's soft. And basically like the olive oil goes all through the garlic. And you can actually see a garlic is kind of like structured like an onion. It mm -hmm. is an allium and it's actually made up of layers like an mm. onion and as so the, you can see the olive oil move through the layers. yeah and cool. they'll start to like sort of 
be these like different degrees of translucency. Anyway, the garlic will become totally saturated with the oil and then you just put it into mason jars and you want to keep it in the fridge. In France, in Europe, they leave it out in the pantry and that's totally cool. But in Canada, we don't do that because the food inspector would not like it because there is an association with garlic preserved in olive oil being a conducive place for botulism to grow. Now, botulism is extremely rare. I don't know when the last time someone in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, whatever, where we are, has had botulism. I've done a lot of research on botulism, but it's pretty rare. But keep it in the fridge, and you don't have to worry about botulism. But it's an anaerobic sort of situation. Uh, but confit is often done with duck. Uh, duck confit you might see around, but it's oh, a... Yeah. It's a French way of preserving things in fat. And so, I imagine that that olive oil would be pretty delicious as well. Yeah. So anytime in your recipe, you just scoop into the mason jar and grab some garlic cloves and some of the olive oil and boom, you put that in whatever you want and it's great. And then you, it's kind of solid in the fridge if you use mm, olive oil. If you use right. canola oil, it'll stay liquidy mostly. It depends on how cold your fridge is. But yeah, you can just use that in a bunch of things you can like sort of mash it a little bit with a spoon and use it in maybe a salad dressing or something like that but it's a great way to stop the garlic that you may have collected over the fall from the farmer's market from getting too punky you don't want to throw it out so you can freeze the cloves or you can do the confit right those are two ideas and because of this full spring we're definitely trying to figure out you know what can what can we serve on our menu and what can we use in the kitchen that comes from the garden? And the answer is things that we have in the freezer and things like that garlic. And then uh, we're starting to get a little bit of greens out of the greenhouse, but you know that's still going to be another couple of weeks. But then we also have a bunch of growing happening upstairs in our grow room. So yeah, we have a grow up and in the grow up we have microgreens and we have hydroponics, uh, which we just set up. Sarah went to the local seed and garden store in the small town next to us. And I asked if they had any nutrients for hydroponic setup, and the guy immediately assumed I was growing weed and then spent about 20 minutes telling me all about his weed setup and all about the things he grew and what his favorite strains were and like on and on and on and on. I, I just kind of was, I was into listening to no, it. No, no, really, we, we're just growing tomatoes, and, and I swear. I, and I thought about telling him like, no, no, I'm just growing vegetables. But, you know, I, I felt like then I didn't want to like distract from his, his uh, monologue. But you can grow pretty much anything hydroponically. But for us in a situation we're in, like you don't really want to grow like tomatoes or cucumbers what i think what i'm excited about is growing sort of larger plants like maybe growing some basil plants uh and growing like swiss chard and head lettuce and things that uh are bigger and that leaf out uh growing spinach maybe growing some kale i know kale uh whereas the microgreens really i've been finding i've been doing that all winter and i find the best ones that grow are the pea shoots they're really delicious they're really sweet they grow really fast and then uh, different kinds of brassicas that are... Brassicas? Just, what are brassicas? Brassicas are like the family of plants that involve uh, broccoli and kale and then a lot of different like Asian greens. Actually, mustards are brassicas as well, uh, cauliflower, cabbage. So I actually have a bunch of extra seed that are just sort of like Asian green seeds that I've collected over the years that I haven't planted. I mean, when you buy like a bag of broccoli seed, like how many of those do you grow? So I mix them all together and then I've been growing those out as microgreens. So they're pretty delicious. Also radish greens um, and growing seeds that are not to grow radish roots, but that are specifically for microgreen sprouting. And they're also really delicious, really nice spicy bite to them. So they're good as like all of these small individual like microgreen sprouts that you can cut and have like a sort of sprinkling of, but you're not getting like big leaves that you would use in a salad. Like you can make a salad out of microgreens, but it's not quite the same. So hydroponics is where I'm hoping that we can grow some of those herbs and and salad greens that we can use that are a little bit more substantial. But this time of year, your best bang for your buck for like big greens is local spinach because a lot of local uh, farmers, organic farmers have been overwintering spinach it's common practice for years now. People are doing an awesome job. And like the bags of spinach we got from uh, 
Wismical Farm and from Graham. I don't know even if they have a name for their farm. I'm sure they do. Uh, fantastic, beautiful, like nutrient packed, delicious. It's like also because the spinach has had to produce a lot of uh, antifreeze, uh, which is like a kind of sugar alcohol type mix. I'm not exactly sure the exact chemistry behind it. The spinach this time of year is super sweet uh, and has really interesting flavors. And because there's a bit of alcohol in there, those like flavors seem stronger. They sort of effervesce. Right. They have like more sort of vile, volatile compounds. We'll yeah. Say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, the yeah. spinach is amazing. And yeah, it's something that like used to be less available in the Maritimes. And now I feel like a lot of organic growers are overwintering spinach and learning how to do it and sharing that information with each other and, and learning from folks in Quebec who have been, you know, really studying it intensively as well. And this year we grew spinach, but uh, because of our greenhouse planning and some maintenance that we had to do, we didn't produce as much spinach Last year, we were self-sufficient in spinach, yeah. but the goal uh, for growing and chefing for our restaurant is to have spinach be the main uh, component of the salad and then the microgreens and the small herby bits be the sort of like, and the mustards be sort of the, you know, the garnish or adding the color and the little snaps of flavor. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, spinach has that really beautiful. And I mean, it's so good because you can eat it raw, you can cook with it, you can wilt it slightly. Like it has a beautiful flavor, but not a strong flavor. Yeah, it's really, I, I don't know, it's it really interesting to figure out like why there's that whole like idea that spinach is gross or bad, that's like kind of like the Popeye, like yeah. uh, the sitcomification of food, like how no one likes anchovies, but they don't actually know because they never tried them. They just assume they yeah, don't like anchovies. Yeah, there's something that Ninja Turtles eat, Because they not humans. saw on TV that, that no, everyone just says, no anchovies. Yeah. But spinach true. is kind of like that too, but it's like, I don't know where that came from. Well, I think it's because it was mostly something that was eaten preserved, like canned spinach or frozen spinach. Like if you bought blocks of like frozen spinach at the grocery store for like two bucks, you know, they defrost down into something that's like usable and unlike a Spanish pita, but it's not like super delicious. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's one of the first processed greens. I, On... I thought of another seed that is a great cold hardy seed, which is arugula. I f arugula is an amazing one that germinates super early and we've grown quite a bit of it in the greenhouse and it's just germinating now. And I love growing it early because the flea beetles just decimate it as soon as they come out, which is as soon as the temperatures start to get warm. So it's interesting arugula because I associate that with like pizza. Yeah, definitely and with summertime. Yeah. And also like with Italy, but like, again, it's like, yeah, here we have another cold, great cold crop that comes from a warm place or is associated with a warm place. And on that note, we'll see you next week. It'll be a little bit warmer next week and a little bit nicer. Yeah, hopefully we'll be past fool's spring and into fool's, well, into actual spring. <laughs>